I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Central, are you glad this morning to be in God's house? Let me begin by first of all commending all of you for being here this morning. I, I know that there's a beach somewhere, a resort somewhere that you could have been on, but you chose to be in God's house this morning and for that you should be commended. Let me tell you the, the type of pastor, the type of person I am. I, I guess this says something about my nature. I, I, I received a number of phone calls from some of our faithful members apologizing for not being able to be in church this morning. They, they were going to go away, be on some beach, and they asked me to pray for them. And I have been praying. I've been praying that it rains all <laughs> weekend. <laughs> So thank you for being here this morning. I, I would also like to thank you, those of you who gave and, and those of you who volunteered at our backpack giveaway this Thursday. We had prepared to give 50 backpacks, but because of the demand, we gave away some 59 backpacks. Am I right with my number, Sharada? This only goes to show that there is a demand for service, even in a community as presumably wealthy as the Upper West Side. And we, Central, are accomplishing and fulfilling that demand. So again, you should be commended. This morning, I'd like to begin a series called Hand Me a Brick. It's about building, building our lives and building a future for this church. Really the impetus for this series is that we need money. Somewhere down the line during this series, I'm, I'm going to ask that, that each of you give sacrificially to a capital campaign that we're starting in the month of October. Even now, I want you to begin to pray about what God would lay on your hearts. Uh, this capital campaign is, is designed to rebuild some as certain aspects of this facility. There's some deferred maintenance that we need to take care of immediately. Now, now I already know what, what most of you are thinking. Capital campaign pastor is going to be preaching about money. I don't want to be around for this. Joel Gregory, former pastor of First Baptist Dallas, used to say that. Whenever he began a series preaching about money, some senior adults who would sit in the front row would take off their hearing aids, put it on the side as a tangible way of telling Pastor Gregory that they were not listening. Central, here's why you should listen when your pastor, when your preacher begins to talk about money. There is no other thing that determines your level of spirituality quite like your spending habits. If you want to determine whether or not you're a mature Christian, simply look at your bank account. Simply tell what you're investing in. And, and this is not just John speaking. This is what Jesus says about the commit, uh, about the connection between our resources and our spiritual lives. If, if you don't believe me, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter six. And for the purpose of our discussion this morning, we will be reading and reviewing together verses 19 through 21, Matthew chapter six. When you get there, announce that you've arrived there by saying amen. If you need another minute, let me know that you need another minute. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. 
where your heart is will also be your treasure central. Hear the word of the Lord for you this morning. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermins destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermins do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And, and Central, can we read this together, verse 21? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You sounded great, why don't we try it one more again? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Will you pray with me? Father, teach us great and wonderful truths contained in your word, Lord God. By your spirit, help us be impacted by what your word says. And, and our prayer, as always, is this, Father, that as your word is explained, you alone and you alone will be exalted. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all who are God's people said, It is referred to as the practice of heart burial. Heart burial is where your heart, after you die, is removed from your body and placed in a strategic location that you have requested. We don't practice this anymore today, but it was very popular and common in the ancient world all the way up to the 13th century. Heart practice, heart burial rather, came into vogue because of the belief that the heart was the seat of the emotions. The heart is, is where your affections, where your desires, where your love lied. And because your heart contained your affections, as a tangible way of showing where your affections truly were. You would ask that your heart be buried in a strategic location. David Livingston, the famous missionary to Africa, after he died because he had so much affection for Africa, though his body was buried in Westminster Abbey in London, his heart was buried under a tree in Africa. Crazy Horse, you, you remember him from your history books. He, he defeated Custer in Custer's last stand after he was mortally wounded in battle. His tribe took his heart and buried it at Wounded Knee, the site of his famous battle. Chopin, the great virtuoso pianist, had a deep love and affection for, for alcohol. They said that he would drink a flask of brandy before and after every performance beat because he had such a fondness for the drink. He requested that upon his death, his heart be taken out and put in a jar of brandy, Imelda Marcos woman of 3,000 shoe fame, because her shoes cannot all be buried with her. That's how many shoes she owns. She, she's asked that her heart be buried in her closet. There, there is this tangible connection between your heart and your affections. Central, I want to pose a question to you this morning. You will die in the future. And if we were still in the habit of practicing heart burial, where would you ask that your heart be buried? Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7 is perhaps the most famous sermon that Jesus ever preached. It is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is a how-to guide for being a disciple. Everything that you want to know about Christian living and about Christian ethics, the Sermon on the Mount contains. Jesus teaches us 
how to treat others in the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus teaches us how to fast in the Sermon on the Mount. Beginning in Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount will have something to say about how a disciple should view material goods. The, this something to say that Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 19, really starts off in, in the model prayer that comes before this section. In the model prayer, Jesus says that every disciple should request from God provisions for that day. Jesus says that we should pray, give us this day our daily bread. As a disciple, you and I should be dependent on God for all of our material needs. And in Matthew 6, 19, Jesus decides to take that prayer a step further. If, as disciples, you and I should be dependent on God for our provisions, then, as disciples, it also means that you and I should not interfere with God providing for us. And one way we interfere with God's provision is by doing the prohibition that Jesus states in verse 19. The prohibition comes to us in the form of a present imperative. So that means what Jesus is prohibiting, he is telling us to stop doing. If you are in the practice of doing this, then Jesus' command to you right now is to stop immediately. The prohibition simply states, do not store for yourselves. That, that phrase, store for yourselves, is actually one word in Greek. That word can be translated to, to save or to gather. It, it's the picture of someone taking valuables in the ancient world, depositing it in a box and burying it. In the ancient world, banks were, were a novel concept in Jesus' day. So people did not trust or feel comfortable preserving their valuables and putting them in banks. So what they would do is that they would find some type of chest, a chest that you can lock, place all of their precious items, their silver, their gold in that box and, and put it, bury it beneath the ground. Or if their valuables came in the form of clothes, they would build an elaborate closet, a, a closet that you can lock and, and put all their clothes in that closet. What, what Jesus is actually referring to when he says store treasure for yourselves is the practice of saving. And on the surface, it almost seems as if Jesus is prohibiting disciples from saving. Clearly, this is not the case. Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. And this presupposes the fact that we are saving in order to leave something behind. And, and throughout Jesus' ministry, he encouraged his followers to be godly stewards of the resources that God had given them. And, and part of being godly stewards of the resources that God has given us is to save something for a rainy day. Jesus is not prohibiting the activity of saving. What well, Jesus is prohibiting the motivation behind our saving. Jesus says that a good thing becomes a bad thing when it is motivated for the wrong reasons. He, he lists two wrong reasons behind storing up treasures. First wrong reason is, is selfishness. Jesus prohibits storing up treasures for yourselves. This prepositional phrase points to the fact that what Jesus is precluding in the lives of disciples is selfish storing up of the resources that God has given to us. When God gives us surplus, he doesn't give us surplus so that we can store it away for our own benefit, but rather when God gives us a surplus, he gives it to us so that we can use for the benefit of others in saying that we should not store up treasures for ourselves, 
Jesus is saying that our surplus should have other people as its intentions. Jesus is instructing us that our surplus should not be guided towards self, but towards others. And good news behind this. If you store the extra that God has given you and, and use it for the benefit of others, Paul promises that God will give you more, not only to store up, but also to give away. Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 10 and 11 says, now the one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. And here's the good news. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. If you recognize it and realize that it is God who gives you that extra and you use it for the benefit of other people, God will always make sure that you have extra. But if you think that your extra should be used for yourself. And, and there's another story. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells the story of a, of a farmer who enjoyed what, not, what could be termed in nothing else a miraculous harvest. He, he had a crop that was so large, it was more than what he could ever wanted, and certainly it was more than what he ever needed. This miraculous surplus created a, a dilemma for the farmer. He had nowhere else to store this surplus. So, so what he decided to do was that he would build and first tear down his smaller barns and then build larger ones. And, and he built the larger ones, put his surplus in that barn, and then he, he said to himself, I have so much grain laid up for myself for many years. This, this is what I'm going to determine to do for the rest of my life. I am going to take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. That was the par farmer's plan for himself, but, but God had other plans for the farmer. Jesus in the story tells us that very night that he decided to store up his surplus for himself, God decided to take his life, and therefore he could do nothing <laughs> with that extra that he wanted to keep for himself. And, and Jesus goes on to say that this is how God will deal with everyone who is rich towards themselves and not rich towards God. What Jesus is prohibiting is selfishness not saving. And what Jesus is prohibiting is short-sightedness not saving. See, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. That phrase, on earth, simply does not do refer to the location of where the treasure is stored, but, but it also says something about one's view of life, one's philosophy of eternity. Earth is, is part of the physical realm that is subject to decay and is coming to an end. Earth is part of this current order of things that God will destroy and replace with a new order. Earth will not last. Second Peter 3, 7 says that one day the Lord, the, the Lord, the one day the Lord of the earth will destroy the earth and everything on it will be laid bare. The issue with storing up treasures on earth is that it ignores the fact that there is a life to come and a world to come after earth. The issue with storing up treasure on earth is that though it makes provisions for the here and now, it does not make provisions for eternity. The issue with storing up treasures on earth is that we ignore the fact that there is a heaven that we also need to prepare for. I, I heard this story, a, a really tragic story, read it the other day, about a family 
and their beloved dog. They, they were going on a two-week vacation, and they called their various friends and family members to see if there was anyone who was willing to dog sit their dog, and, and no one accepted that request. They called around hoping to find a, a, a hotel for dogs where that dog could stay for the next two weeks, but unfortunately they could find no place to keep their dog, so, so they made a stupid decision. They decided that they would put their dog in their basement, lay out mats so that the dog could, could use the bathroom whenever he wanted to, and also lay out two weeks of food for that dog. You immediately know what happened. After they came home, they found their dog dead in the basement. I, I learned something that day about the, the nature of dogs through reading the article. The dog did not eat himself to death. There was this common myth around that said that dogs did not have a shut off valve, that, that if you put food in front of a dog, that a dog will eat himself to death. Do dogs do, in fact, have a shut off valve. But what dogs cannot do is prepare for the future. You see, the, the dog didn't know that the food that was in these bowls was actually food that was supposed to last him for two weeks. So whenever he got hungry, he ate all that he could eat without keeping some in reserve for the future. And he actually died because he starved to death. He had eaten all his two weeks worth of food within the first two and a half days. And there was nothing left for him to eat thereafter. And how this dog died is how most people live. We use the resources that were intended to secure our future and our eternity as if those resources were only intended to be used today. That's why Jesus says that it's not good to keep to store your treasures on earth because it ignores the fact that there is a heaven that you and I, we need to prepare for. Jesus tells us why there's a, a problem with storing our our treasures selfishly and being short-sighted with how we store our treasures. Our, our treasures were, were intended, our, our resources were intended to, in part, give us a, a sense of security. You and I, we, we save so that we can have some nest egg in, in case something happens. It, 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 it's us being good stewards, it's, it's us preserving or attempting to preserve our future but the problem with that is if that is what you're storing your treasures for, then your future is not as secure as you may think it is. Jesus says to us what, what is wrong with this type of thinking is that there, there are problems that could interfere, interrupt your future. He points to moths and, and vermin. If, if your treasure were clothes, if, if, if you were holding on to, to clothes in Jesus' day, you, you, you can bury them, you, you, you can put them aside, but there's nothing that you can do to, to keep moths from eating away at them. The clothes moth was a, was a popular animal found in the ancient Near East, and, and they were liable to eat away at all types of clothing from wool to polyester. You couldn't keep the clothes moths away from your treasure, and, and if your treasure was buried beneath your, the ground, th then what could you do to keep thieves from getting at it? Thieves, knowing that there was potential treasure buried beneath every home, would often dig beneath homes looking for treasure. Jesus says that if your security is based on your treasure, then, then your security is unstable at best because there are factors working against your treasure that can take them away from you. I, I, I know what you're thinking. Pastor, I, I don't have this problem, because my security, my treasure is not buried underneath my bed. It's not kept in a closet somewhere. My, my security, my, my treasure is my 401k, <laughs> and that's in my investment. My, my security, my, my treasure 
is in the bank and it's safe there. Oh, really? <laughs> All it takes is one stock market crash for your security to be lost. All, all it takes is one shysty investment banker for you to lose all of your hard-earned savings. All it takes is one disaster for your security, for your treasures to be gone away with. The threat was real in Jesus' day, and the threat is still real today. That if your treasure is on earth, if your treasure is used for yourself, your treasure is susceptible to be taken away. Jesus offers us an alternative to storing our treasures for ourselves and, and on earth. The exhortation of verse 20 is actually very similar to the prohibition of verse 19. What Jesus discourages in verse 19, he encourages in verse 20. He tells us it is good to store treasures for yourself. It's, it's almost like he's encouraging us again to be selfish, but he says that the important distinguish, it's important to distinguish where you keep your treasure. It's, it, it's bad if you save for yourself on earth. It becomes good when you save for yourself in heaven. By telling us that we should store treasure for ourselves in heaven, Jesus isn't telling us that we need to work for our salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God that you cannot earn. Jesus paid all the necessary requirements in order for you to be saved. But what Jesus is telling us is that even though we are saved, we should still be working for the approval of God so that we can receive tangible rewards in heaven. In Matthew 19, 21, Jesus challenged the rich young ruler to give away all of his possessions to the poor so that he would have treasure in heaven. Treasure in heaven is the disciples' work of gaining God's approval through good works. Heaven, treasure in heaven is stored by committing to the priorities of Christ. We invest in our heavenly bank account when we do the things that Christ commands us, when we forgive the undeserving, when we love the valueless, when, when we seek reconciliation with, the bro with our offended brothers. These are the very things that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount will secure for us a great reward in heaven. There is a, an implication, a clear implication that comes from verse 20, that God sees what you're doing, that God is aware of what you're doing and that God will reward you based on what you're doing. Even if no one else ever says thank you, even if no one else ever shakes their hand and even if you, gain, you never gain the approval of others, God sees the hard work that you do. God sees how you love others, God sees how you forgive. God sees how you attempt to reconcile with others. And, and God says that whenever you do those things, you are investing in your heavenly bank account. So, so keep praying, keep forgiving, keep reconciling, keep loving, because your work does not go unnoticed. And more importantly, your work will not go unrewarded. Storing treasure in heaven requires two things. It, it requires awareness and activity. It means that you have to be aware that there is an eternity for you to strive for. And you have to be active so that your place in eternity 
is secured. Even if no one else recognizes what you're doing, you need to continue to be active and aware of your future goals. Brian Loritz tells this story. He was watching Tiger Woods during a practice round when Tiger Woods was Tiger Woods when he was the best golfer in the world. It was on the Augusta National Golf Club. And for those of you who are familiar with golf, Augusta National is the site of the most famous golf tournament in the world, the Masters. It was during the, the week, a, a Tuesday, when Tiger was practicing for the tournament beginning that Thursday. Now, most golfers can aim for a flag, and, and when they aim for that flag, most professional golfers can get their ball at least within 20 feet of the flag, at least within 20 feet of the flag. But throughout his round, Tiger kept missing the flag by 30, 40, sometimes by 50 feet. And after every shot, he would miss the flag by, by several feet. He would turn around and high five his caddy as if he had just hit the greatest shot in the world. His playing partners that day, they were hitting the ball and coming within feet of the flag and, and Tiger was missing the flag entirely. But after every missed shot, he was turning around, high-fiving his caddy and celebrating. One shot during one of the final holes, Tiger took the golf shot and missed the flag by about 70 feet. It was a horrible golf shot. Yet he turned around, hugged his caddy as if he had just hit the greatest shot in the world. Brian says he was confused until someone explained it to him. Tiger, though he was playing a practice round, he was not aiming for where the flag was that day. He was aiming for where the flag would be on Sunday. <laughs> now, <laughs> I, I know may, maybe some of you aren't golf enthusiasts like I am, so, so let me tell you what happens on Sunday. Sunday is the final day of the tournament. Sunday is where the champion is get, championship is given. Sunday is where the champion is crowned. Sunday is the day they write your name on the trophy. Sunday is the day they put the green jacket on you. Sunday is the day you go down in history. Sunday is the day you get your reward in the form of a big $1.2 million check. Tiger, though he was playing on a Tuesday, was shooting as if he was living for Sunday. Come here, Central. There is a Sunday in your future. The Bible says that that Sunday will come like a thief in the night, but you'll know it's Sunday because you'll hear the trumpets blast and, and the clouds will open and the Son of Man will come riding on the clouds. And, and on that Sunday, the Bible says Jesus will reward us for the good that we've done. And here's all that Jesus is trying to tell us in verse 20. Even though you're living for today, you should be preparing as if it's Sunday. We should be storing our treasures in heaven. And Jesus, finally, in verse 21, tells us why this is so important. What's the significance of, of storing our treasures in heaven rather than storing our, our treasures on earth? It's, it's, it's not that God is concerned with your money. God doesn't need your money. In fact, even if you were to take all of your possessions and lay it at God's feet, it would not impact God's wealth at 
all, the Bible tells us he owns the cows on a thousand hills. God is not concerned with your money. In Exodus chapter 20, it gives us the, the Ten Commandments, the, 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 the constitution for the nation of Israel. And the very first commandment, some would say, would be, some would say the most important commandment is the one that says that we shall have no other gods before God. And later on and throughout scripture, God reminds us that he is a jealous God. What scripture teaches us about God, though, though he doesn't care about your money, what he does care about is your heart, that God desires your affections, that, that God craves your affections, and God wishes that nothing else in your life would compete with your affections towards him. So in prohibiting us storing treasures in heaven, what God, what Jesus is, is teaching us is that we should refrain from idolatry because it's idolatry if you value earthly possessions more than you value heavenly treasures. It's idolatry for you to store treasures on earth rather than storing treasures for your eternity in heaven. Let these words impact you again from verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also that. Jesus is fighting for your heart. Therefore, he's telling you, don't place treasures on earth because if you do, that's an indication that your heart is not towards God and not towards the things of heaven. The ancient city of, of Pompeii was was an incredible city in Rome that unfortunately was destroyed when Mount Vesuvius erupted in AD 79. If you ever go see pictures of that site, th those pictures are incredible. They are surreal and ghastly all at the same time. Of the 20,000 inhabitants of Pompeii, some 2,000 lost their lives. And many of them lost their lives for one reason. As the volcano erupted, those who cared for their lives ran out the city and escaped. But as the volcano erupted, those who cared for their earthly treasures went back into their homes and tried to carry out as many valuables as they possibly could find. And, and one of the ghostly remnants of the Vesuvius eruption on the very site of the excavation of Pompeii is this stone statue of what looks like a woman who had a box of treasures in her hand. She, she died because she went back to her house to get her stored box of jewelry. Jesus reminds us that this earth is coming to an end and you don't want to go the way of this woman who heart was in her treasures and because of this she ran back into her home to get a few trinkets and by doing so she lost her life. Don't bury your treasures on this earth bury your treasures in heaven and God will keep it safe for you until you get there. Will you pray with me? Father God, I do thank you for your word, Lord God, and, and I do thank you for the challenge that you've given us in your word, Lord God. Help us not to value the things of this earth so much so that we die with them when this earth is destroyed, but Lord God, help us to lay our treasures in heaven. And in doing so, both our treasures and our lives will be secure. Now we give this time over to you, Lord God, and, and we pray that through the power of your spirit, you would convince someone to begin to store treasures in heaven by committing their lives to Jesus. And, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.